Welcome to WGVU Public Media's Decision 2020. In this online forum, we introduce you to the Michigan Supreme Court Justice candidates. This is an opportunity for voters to hear directly from the judicial candidates. We're recording these interviews via Zoom from the studios of the Meyer Public Broadcast Center at Grand Valley State University. Today's recording is in association with the Grand Rapids Bar Association. It generated the five questions we'll be asking the candidates. Joining us now is Carrie Lee Morgan. Uh, my name is Carrie Morgan and I'm running for the Michigan Supreme Court. Um, I am an attorney. I've been licensed since 1981. I'm admitted to practice here in Michigan as well as Virginia and the District of Columbia. Um, is, I'm also admitted in the federal courts, the Western and Eastern Districts of Michigan, as well as the Sixth Circuit and the United States Supreme Court. Uh, prior to becoming uh, uh, back to Michigan, actually, I was uh, an attorney advisor with the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in Washington, D.C. That was in the Reagan and Bush administrations. And so I'm happy to have been back here many years and been practicing law uh, since the 80s. And um, I'm looking forward to the, to the uh, run for the uh, Michigan Supreme Court. Could you please tell us why you feel you should be elected to the Michigan Supreme Court? I think uh, the qualifications that I possess in terms of not merely my experience in the law and in litigation and appeals really qualifies me to be on the bench, but more important than those details, there is the idea that the courts are really the last um, frontier, the last entity to protect the rights of people from overreaching by the executive branch and the legislature. And I have a very keen interest in um, both uh, articulating and in protecting the rights of the people, particularly under the Michigan Constitution in Article 1. If we don't have judges that will protect the rights of the people, the whole purpose of the civil government is, uh, fails, since it's the purpose of government to secure our rights. And I feel as a justice of the Supreme Court, I could do that very ably. The Michigan Supreme Court is responsible for the general administrative supervision of all courts in Michigan. Where do you see our courts in need of improvement and how would you address that? So when you look at the, uh, the administrative side of the Supreme Court, it oversees the Court of Appeals and the circuit courts and the district courts in the state. And that's a lot of oversight and administration, handling of cases, the day-to-day -day activities of courts are all subject to the general oversight of the Michigan Supreme Court. But I think if there's going to be improvement, it has to be down in the circuit court level. Frankly, my practice in the circuit court shows me that the circuit court judges carry a very heavy burden and heavy obligation to deal with all the cases that are filed. And I think that the uh, Michigan Supreme Court can try and help them and assist them um, by actually uh, working towards the uh, remote uh, processing of some non-essential uh, legal proceedings. I know that with the COVID situation, there's been an emphasis on the ability to have remote uh, or video or Zooming um, hearings, and that's become pretty commonplace, I think there needs to be more training and there needs to be certainly more uh, funds made available to the circuit courts to update and modernize in that sense. We're talking about courts that have traditionally only been generally accessible to people. And I think from the, from the individual's point of view, apart from any lawyers involvement in the system, uh, there's got to be more focus and education on how uh, individuals that are appearing or want to appear before courts that have lawsuits filed, they have to really be able to express their uh, arguments and their views. Uh, and perhaps uh, we can look at a combined uh, remote as well as in-person uh, situation for that purpose. The killings of George Floyd and other minorities and the seemingly disparate treatment of persons of color in our system of justice raise the question of whether justice is truly blind. How do you propose to fortify the public's trust in the judiciary? 
Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, the public's trust in the judiciary is a function of how the public perceives the judiciary. Um, to the extent the judiciary confines itself to the execution of the law, to the application of the law as defined uh, both in the Constitution and the statutes of the state, um, then any, any apparent or seeming injustice is really a legislative problem uh, as the courts are not supposed to be in the policy making business. Um, I think that it's important, however, that when an individual's rights are violated, either by the government or by uh, another party, that the judges have to be more attentive to the vindication of those rights and they have to stop favoring or looking at the government's position as if it's somehow preferred or preferential. I think they need to go back, uh, as many judges do, uh, but I think from a philosophical point of view, an emphasis on the equality of people that appear before the bench uh, has to be uh, one of the real essential groundings in order for the public to say, yeah, the judiciary, they're, they're good, they're a good branch, they're doing my job, realizing, of course, that every civil action has somebody who prevails and somebody who does not prevail. And we just can't have uh, judge the judiciary on the basis of whether I won or lost. Beyond that, we have to be careful that the judiciary doesn't become a, a marketing division uh, that markets itself in a way that's uh, superficial and uh, uh, not really responsive to the needs of justice. The State Joint Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration reported in January of this year that crime in Michigan is at a 50-year low, and yet the number of people incarcerated in county jails has tripled since the 1970s. That same study showed that black men made up 29% of jail admissions, while making up only 6% of the state's population. What role do you see Michigan courts playing in criminal justice reform? Well, that's a great question. Um... The nature of reform and criminal justice reform is essentially a legislative function. It's for the legislature to take the lead in this area and determine whether or not the crimes that it has uh, defined in the law uh, and the punishments to those crimes are fair and equitable or whether they're excessive um, and, and disproportionately uh, applied uh, because of the nature of the offense. However, uh, the, the legislature, I think, it carries the burden in reform. I would not advocate that the judicial branch engage in reform per se, since they simply are to apply the law as given. Um, you know, judges are selected uh, by the people. It's for the people to decide the, the qualifications of the judges or their experience and who they want on the bench. If the people elect judges that uh, do not follow the law or decide to take the uh, color or the uh, uh, gender of, or other characteristics into account, their, their wealth, their economic conditions, then that's a problem that those judges have to try and say, no, I'm, I'm not here for that purpose. I'm here to merely look at the parties before me and look at the law and apply the law as written. And so any reform uh, has got to come out of the legislative branch and the judicial branch can uh, reemphasize that judges should uh, be no respecter of persons. That's a great principle going back to the laws of Moses actually that uh, judges should be selected and they should not reflect or represent or take notice of the rich or the poor. Michigan's trial courts are overwhelmed with cases and parties representing themselves because they cannot afford counsel. And there is a perception held by many that justice favors the wealthy. As the saying goes, justice delayed is justice denied. What would you do as a justice on the Supreme Court to address these issues? Well, I've been uh, in cases in which uh, the other side was unrepresented. 
uh, and I have uh, witnessed um, proceedings in which both parties are unrepresented by attorneys. I think we have to understand that the court rules are all set up essentially to establish a mechanism by which courts can orderly process uh, litigation. However, they are written in a way that if you're not an attorney, it's difficult to figure out what's going on. Um, in the district courts, it's a lot more free flowing. Uh, if you represent yourself in the district courts, I think you have a much better opportunity to have the judge evaluate uh, and being an attorney is uh, not as much uh, important with following the rules. Uh, in the circuit courts, it's a little more difficult and obviously in the Court of Appeals, uh, it's even more difficult, I think, to represent yourself as you go up. I think the Supreme Court needs to evaluate whether or not it's going to look to the circuit courts and determine whether or not additional procedures or pro per procedures might not be a good or might be a good option rather than the traditional court rules um, uh, apart from uh, you know a complaint and an answer. But with regard to motion practice, uh, most laymen don't know anything about motion practice. They don't know anything about summary disposition or, or motions to quash and these sort of things. And without an attorney, they're, they're gonna be disadvantaged. I think maybe uh, uh, if the court looked at a, some type of expedited procedure or alternate rules for pro per, uh, pro per uh, individuals, that might be something that would aid individuals in vindicating their rights and not having the rules and the procedures stand as an obstacle to them. Carrie Lee Morgan, thank you for joining us. From all of us here at WGVU Public Media, we thank you for logging on and please get out and vote Tuesday, November 3rd.